Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our afternoon session of QC40. So we are live right now and getting ready to begin our academic talks. We have two afternoon keynotes summarizing the theory and experimental results from Sarah Sheldon of IBM and Aram Harrow of MIT. After both these talks, we will split into two parallel sessions, one focusing on experiment hardware and the other on theory and software. So for the sake of time, I just want to jump right in. I'm going to introduce Sarah quickly, and then she's going to take it away. Um, people can ask questions throughout the talk, and I will do my best. Hopefully at the end, we'll have time to answer a few of them. All right. So Sarah Sheldon is a research scientist at IBM Quantum. She leads the quantum demonstrations team. She studied quantum control techniques in magnetic resonance experiments for her PhD, where she received in 2013 from MIT. Her work at IBM has focused on improving the physical operations that are the building blocks for quantum algorithms, developing techniques for characterizing quantum devices and demonstrating the capabilities of our current quantum systems. So Sarah, thank you so much for being here today and I'll just let you take it from here. Thank you, Olivia. I am going to put up my slides. Um, just, just like, all right, um, so hopefully you can see that, jump in if, uh, if there's anything uh, off. But um, thank you for um, having me here at uh, QC40 today. I'm really happy to introduce the hardware and experiment track. Um, and to get started, I, um, I'm going to give really a general overview of kind of where um, things are in quantum hardware today and um, what I think some of the challenges that face all, all um, uh, quantum computing architectures. And because uh, the context is um, the anniversary of, of the Physics of Computation Conference in 1981, I wanted to put where we are in the context of this, this history. Um, so, um, you know, one, one thing I want to point out on this timeline, which is, you know, not, not a history of all the important breakthroughs that have taken place over the past 40 years, uh, but I think um, just trying to show some of the trends that have happened. Um, and I want to point out that um, advances in hardware have really happened over these past four decades and even earlier, um, really in parallel with advances in, in theory. So this, this work has been very active. Um, and a lot of the qubit architectures that um, people are studying today and using for larger and larger experiments um, have been around for some time. So um, a lot of um, a lot of these different architectures were proposed in the 90s um, and have continued to be in use since that time. Um, the transmon qubit, which is the last one I have listed here, uh, you know, was first demonstrated in 2007. Um, but of course, work on superconducting qubits predated that. And um, as I think was mentioned this morning in um, the early earlier talks, um, you know, the technology for these um, really predated the field of quantum computing. So, you know, I've, I've heard from my colleagues in IBM research about, uh, you know, uh, superconducting classical computing with Joseph's injection that people worked on in the 80s and, um, you know, didn't didn't gain as much traction then, but kind of, um, you know, now we see um, see this uh, kind of fundamental physics being reused in a new field. And I think really highlights the um, the idea that in research, you know, some some work that um, that was kind of set aside at one point can come back around and take on a new life in in a new field. And really, a lot of the work that's happened um, is building off of earlier research within um, uh, experiments of quantum mechanics. So you know, a lot of the techniques that we use today. Um, are derived from um, magnetic resonance experiments on the control side. Um, we're really um, building off of um, fundamental technologies from uh, atomic and optical physics. Uh, so this is really a lot of the work that we do today is based on fairly mature technologies, but trying to use it in this really specific way for quantum computing. So in the past maybe 20 years or so, people have been working on small scale demonstrations of um, you know, the canonical quantum algorithms. Um, there have been, you know, these few qubit demonstrations of factoring um, and of, you know, Deutsch Josa, um, Bernstein Basrani, other, um, other demonstrations that are always on, you know, a few qubits. And of course, they're noisy qubits because that's what we have um, today. So the results are, 
um, not something that uh, that beat anything you could do on classical hardware at this point, um, but they're they're demonstrating progress over this time. And now we're in this era where people are really um, you know looking at devices that are um, you know on the threshold of not being able to be simulated classically. And we're exploring what can we do with these devices in the near term. Um, so it's a really interesting time to, to be working with them. Um, and then in parallel, you know, fundamental hardware research has been going on um, for this entire time and will continue. Um, we need to keep making uh, our fundamental systems better. We need to um, figure out how to scale them to larger and larger sizes. And um, this research is, is going to keep being important. So let's, um, let's now look where we are today and see what, what challenges lie ahead. Um, so as on the previous slide, this was a very incomplete history of um, hardware and quantum computing. This is a very incomplete list of qubits um, that, that people use to pursue uh, different quantum computing architectures. But I think they capture the different ways that people, um, people are studying quantum computing and the different control techniques and the um, the apparatus that that are involved. Um, so, uh, you know, starting with superconducting qubits, uh, this is, you know, uh, I, I'm uh, at IBM, so this is the one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'll be using superconducting qubits for uh, uh, an example of the the challenges that we uh, face in in improving our quantum hardware. But I think um, most of what I talk about should really apply to any of these systems. Um, so there was a great, great overview um, by Steve Gervin of, on superconducting qubits this morning. Um, but to summarize, uh, the, the qubit is, you know, this superconducting circuit that we can design and fabricate on a chip. And um, when we cool it down, the energy levels are quantized and has a structure that we, we can, you know, compare it to. And uh, we, we call it an artificial atom and we can build a qubit out of it. Uh, and we control the state of this qubit with microwave pulses um, and also with magnetic flux if we're tuning the frequencies of qubits. Um, now, whereas uh, superconducting qubits, we can really um, design and fabricate and have a lot of control over what the fundamental system is, trapped ions really, um, in contrast, um, uh, take advantage of you know, a very natural system. Um, so atomic systems, um, and there's a number of different implementations using different ion species. They can be, um, these are ions that are confined within an RF uh, uh, electromagnetic field, and um, they can be confined on uh, in a chip trap or in free space and vacuum systems. Um, and depending on which type of ion people are using, um, there are different options for finding a pair of stable electronic energy levels to use as the qubit. And in this case, the controls are uh, lasers and um, depending, on, depending on the type of ions, um, people can uh, also incorporate microwave control. Um, the next, um, well, I, I should add, there are, there are other kind of categories of qubits that are very similar um, and are based on the same atomic um, physics. So, you know, neutral atoms or Rydberg atoms are also used for studying quantum computing and quantum simulation. Uh, spin qubits, I think, um, you know, I, uh, I uh, studied NMR in my PhD, so uh, spin physics is very, um, I find it very intuitive, and I think you can easily see how uh, a spin one half with an up and down state maps very um, easily to to the zero and one states of a qubit. Here I'm showing um, a picture of a, uh, a qubit that's based on the spin of an electron that's confined in a quantum dot. Um, and in this case, the controls are DC and RF uh, fields. Um, there are also spins that are um, used in quantum, uh, uh, quantum experiments that are um, from defects in silicon or NV centers. Um, and these also will use um, RF or microwave control um, uh, to, to control the state of the spin. And then finally, um, I have listed here photons, which I think are sort of fundamentally different from the other three. Um, they don't interact with electromagnetic fields, but we have to use optics to, um, uh, to, to control these, um, these qubits. And they, um, 
the computational space is uh, the, you know, encoded in the spatial degree of freedom, so the path that the photon takes, or, or you could encode in, in polarization. Um, and um, right, so and the the optical components could be you know optical uh, beam splitters and phase shifters that um, implement the quantum gates uh, for a circuit. And I'm showing an example of a tabletop system, um, but these have also been built as um, integrated photonic systems um, as well. So all of these uh, all of these systems have come very far and are very actively researched today. Um, both in industry and academia. Um, and uh, I want to kind of go generically to think about what do we need um, to, to um, what do we need to, for all of the components for hardware to put everything together to run quantum algorithms and how do we um, track the performance of them. Um, so as an example, if we think about what, what do we need to um, actually run quantum experiments, um, we can think of uh, quantum phase estimation, which is um, an important subroutine that's relevant for a lot of algorithms and applications like chemistry. Um, this is not something we can really successfully run today because the number of qubits required and the um, circuit depth required to uh, really look at a useful problem exceeds what um, current hardware is capable of today. Um, but we can we can look at all of the components that are necessary here. So one, you know, we need we need a bunch of qubits, um, and we need to be able to apply um, uh, a bunch of gates in sequence uh, up to some circuit depth. So we care about you know being able to put qubits together and to couple them, um, and these gates need to have some uh, uh, small, small enough error that we can um, that we can run this entire circuit without losing uh, losing our coherent information. Um, and you see from the way that this circuit is written out that there are gates between very far away qubits in the this top register to uh, the qubit down here. So we also care about the connectivity. If not all of these qubits are coupled together, then we have to insert swap gates. Um, and this becomes an even longer circuit. Um, and then finally, we have to measure at the end of the experiment. So we also uh, care about our measurement errors, um, especially as uh, the size of the system grows larger. Now, this is assuming we have logical qubits, um, which uh, increases kind of our overhead on the experimental side. So um, ultimately, we want to get to fault tolerant operation um, and that requires implementing error correcting codes where our logical qubits are encoded into many physical qubits. So now we have even more qubits that we have to work with. Um, and the way that we um, uh, uh, run these codes, for example, um, I'm, I'm showing uh, a topological code, specifically the surface code, where um, in order to detect errors, we have to run these parity check circuits um, between uh, our, um, which, which are detecting um, if errors occurred on our data qubits um, by doing these parity checks on, on the Ancilla. Um, and what you can see here is that we, we need to detect this measurement. And then in order to correct, we have to have some kind of feedback um, that um, in our, we have, some, have to have some kind of classical quantum interface where we read in this measurement and then feed back into the error correcting um, circuit if an error has occurred. Uh, so not only do we have certain thresholds for errors and certain numbers of qubits that are required, um, but there's also this additional measurement um, and uh, a classical quantum interface that we have to consider. Now, fault tolerant operation is still some ways away, but in the near term, we, we really still have these same components, maybe just with less stringent requirements. Um, so a very, uh, you know, um, a, a model of um, computing um, in the near term that is uh, of a lot of interest right now is um, variational quantum algorithms where uh, our quantum circuit is parameterized. So the gates that we apply um, have some parameters that are updated within a classical loop. So we run this quantum circuit, do some measurements, um, and then feed that into a classical optimizer, which updates the parameters, and then we run this again. 
So because the these gates are now parameterized, we're maybe a little bit um, a little bit immune to coherent errors that might have happened because of our cal you know, poor calibrations. Um, and um, but we still we still need to be able to do a long depth circuit here in order to be able to reach um, wherever in the space the um, the answer to our our problem lies. Um, and so we don't have to have this quantum classical feedback that's happening within the circuit, but we still have this loop here, um, which we want to make as fast as possible uh, in order to be able to run these experiments in a reasonable amount of time. So to get into the specifics of what, um, what we try to uh, improve in our system uh, in order to get to better performance. Um, it's useful to think of the different kinds of benchmarks that, that we look at in, in assessing a whole quantum system. Um, so this is our benchmarking pyramid where um, each layer is uh, kind of a different um, different layer of control and, uh, and design where they get more and more complex as we go up. Um, and each layer is kind of associated with some uh, characteristics of the system and some sets of uh, performance metrics, um, methods of, of measuring um, those parameters. So as we um, make improvements on the lower levels, those should um, push up into the higher levels and improve performance up here in the, the benchmarks that we measure here. Um, but there's additional, uh, additional um, complexity that can add in at each level. So to start from the bottom, um, we have our device level metrics, which are really dependent on you know, the intrinsic qubit quality. So these are things that are controlled by our device design and our fabrication. Um, so that includes T1 and T2, um, our coupling strings um, uh, could, could include um, basic measurements of crosstalk, crosstalk and, and readout. Um, so uh, to highlight one of these, um, coherence has been um, one of the main challenges on uh, for superconducting qubits, uh, especially over um, the past 20 years. Uh, as you can see from this plot, the first measurements of superconducting qubits, the coherence times um, were uh, you know, uh, nanoseconds. And um, we've, we've gotten that up many orders of magnitude so that we now have um, repeatable coherence times in the hundreds of uh, microseconds, and that um, that improvement has come from a lot of research in different areas: material science, design of qubits, um, packaging, shielding. Um, really, a lot of work um, from different aspects of engineering, material science, and uh, microwave design and physics. So. Um, you know, this is a huge improvement, but with gate times that are in the tens to hundreds of nanoseconds, this is still a limiting factor in how long of a circuit can we successfully run before we lose um, we lose our quantum information. Um, so this is something we still have to work on um, to get coherence higher. Um, so now we, we move up into the next uh, next level of this pyramid where now we're looking at um, our operations, so our, our one and two qubit gates, kind of the fundamental building blocks of our quantum circuit. Now, these still depend on um, the lower level, T1 and T2 set a fundamental limit to how good our um, gate fidelities are going to be. But now we have, have this additional factor of um, our control techniques and how good our gate calibrations are. Um, so, in superconducting qubits, and um, this is similar in other systems, uh, we control the state of the qubit by applying some energy in the form of a microwave pulse. And this pulse has to be very ca carefully calibrated so that we can rotate the state of the qubit um, very precisely to uh, the, you know, the state that we want. And um, with microwave pulses, we're, we're operating around five gigahertz here. Uh, there's a number of parameters that we we um, we can calibrate, like the amplitude, the phase, the frequency, um, or do more sophisticated pulse shaping um, to to try to um, minimize the error on these controls. So a lot of the calibration routines that we run look like these kinds of sequences, where 
We might do uh, Ravi experiments where we vary the amplitude of the pulse um, to find uh, the right rotation angle, uh, Ramsey experiments to find phases and frequencies, and we rely a lot on error amplification sequences where we do a sequence, we repeat a sequence of pulses in order to um, take any coherent error that's happening and, and multiply that um, so we have a finer, um, finer measurement of what error does exist. And these can be um, not just the same pulse repeated over uh, many times, but it can be some sequence of different pulses that's kind of isolating one error. And once we've run these calibrations, um, there's different uh, ways to measure the error rates, um, such, as, uh, such as state or process tomography. Um, and um, one standard way is, is randomized benefit benchmarking, which uh, doesn't, is not susceptible to errors like state preparation and measurement. Um, and randomized benchmarking works by applying random sequences of gates um, drawn from the Clifford group specifically. Um, and then at the end of the sequence, applying uh, a final gate, which is, a, which is the inverse of the entire sequence that came before. So if there's no noise in the system, the qubit should be um, back in the ground state at the end of this um, at the end of the sequence. So we average over many instances of these sequences and plot the state of the qubit as a function of the length of the sequence. And we get some uh, exponential curve and from the um, decay parameter, we can, extract, uh, we can extract the average error rate um, for gates in this system. Now to go to, uh, you know, beyond one and two qubit gates, um, we, we recognize that these gates aren't happening in isolation. When we apply pulses here, um, we, uh, you know, this qubit may be weakly coupled to its neighbors, and in fact it is. And we want to know what's the effect on neighbors when we want um, a gate that's actually isolated. Or when we're applying two um, uh, gates in parallel, um, is the perf the, uh, the operation of those gates different from when they're performed in isolation. Um, so this, you know, the, the couplings that are um, designed between these qubits is at the lowest level. Um, and we can um, quantify, or we can try to mitigate the effects of calibration through control techniques. Um, and then when we put everything together in a circuit, um, you know, we might see the effects of crosstalk still in our our larger circuits. So that's um, where we finally get to these holistic benchmarks at the top, where now we're adding in um, additional complexity in the forms of circuit compilation, um, dynamical decoupling techniques, et cetera. And the one example I want to give here is quantum volume. This is the metric that um, we've really, uh, that we have tied our devices to at IBM um, because it's a, a very, um, it's a nice signifier of progress and demonstrates significant improvement in quantum hardware when, uh, when we see an improvement in quantum volume. Um, so this, this particular metric, um, it works by applying random model circuits, which um, kind of represent a generic algorithm that we could run on, on hardware. And the structure of the circuit looks like this, where there's um, layers of uh, two qubit gates um, drawn randomly from SU4 and between random pairings of, of qubits. Um, and we look at circuits that have a square shape, so the number of qubits is equal to uh, the number of these entangling layers or the depth of the circuit. Now, because we're dealing with small enough numbers of circuits, uh, small enough numbers of qubits at this point, we can simulate the, um, we can simulate these random circuits um, if in the ideal case. And um, we can compare the output of an ideal simulation with the output of, the, of an experiment. And in order to quantify a success rate of how close our experiment was to ideal, um, we use a, what's called a heavy output probability. Um, and this is, um, this is defined as, uh, you know, if you take all the uh, possible output bit strings from the experiment and you plot a histogram like this, then the heavy output probability is calculated by adding up all of the, the counts um, that were in, uh, uh, that were in bit strings that were more likely than the average bit string. 
So if we had a very uh, uniform distribution, then there's not going to be very many heavy outputs um, because they're all close to the average bit string. Um, but if we had a very peak distribution, if everything, um, if, if we should just find everything in, you know, the one zero, 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 zero state, um, then that uh, we should, you know, 100% of the time measure that, that heavy output. Um, and then, so we, we set a threshold for success if the heavy output probability is larger than two thirds. Um, and then finally, um, the, the quantum volume, if, if we um, successfully measured uh, a heavy output probability over two thirds for a circuit um, of width n or equivalently depth n, then the quantum volume uh, would be two to the n. So we've seen over the past few years significant improvements in quantum volume that have come from all of these things that I've mentioned, device improvements, compiler improvements, um, dynamical decoupling and gate calibrations, um, and it really uh, captures all of these different elements. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the circuit quality, and I just want to briefly mention that there are other, um, other components besides you know, just reducing the gate errors, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, you know, eventually we care about being able to do feedback with a um, with mid-circuit measurements and feedback, um, and having this quantum classical interface, we also care about um, you know some of these experiments are very very long. If we're doing um, iterative uh, 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 variational circuits, and we have to repeat um, repeatedly measurement many repeat the measurement many times, then um, we care about how long it takes to to get circuits through um, so um, in addition to uh, circuit quality we can also talk about capacity how um, you know kind of what's our throughput um, so thinking about how to reduce measurement time and reset um, the system and reduce the reset time so the latency between experiments is very important as well and then finally variety is kind of getting at that uh, incorporation of mid circuit measurement and feedback um, and the different ways that we can construct circuits if we have those elements. Um, so there's this example of iterative um, phase estimation in this paper, um, and more generally, if we if we have a measurement in feed forward, we can use that to reduce circuit depth in the case where um, you know we have limited connectivity or or larger gate errors. Um, so finally, um, I, you know, what about scaling? This is off, uh, you know one of the great challenges. Um, that's going to continue for, for quantum hardware um, for many years as we scale to um, each kind of next tier um, in, in size of, of the system. And there's a number of things that we have to think about. Um, this is really an entirely, um, you, you know, an, an entire talk could be made out of each of these. Um, so I'll say there's, there's a lot of challenges in fabrication and controls and trying to connect systems together once they're at the, the maximum size that's sort of reasonable. Um, and this will, I think, be a, a continued focus of the, the coming years. Um, so finally, um, you know, I think just to, to sum up, um, you know, there's been a lot of progress over the past um, decades, and it's, it's been a really exciting time to see um, the improvements in quantum hardware and the, the new experiments that people are doing today. And um, I'm really excited to, to introduce this um, hardware and experiment track and see some of the latest work that's, um, that, that people will be presenting on today. Um, so with that, I will say thank you and um, see if there are any questions. Hey, Sarah, can you hear me again? I can. Okay, great. Um, we have time for about one question. So this question asks, apart from architecture and coherence times, well, basically what are the key differences between the various qubit architectures that you mentioned? Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's quite a few differences. I mean, in superconducting qubits, we can kind of design them and say, we, we want to place things um, with this uh, coupling map, and we have a lot of control, which um, I find really fun coming from an NMR background where the molecule is the molecule, you know. Um, uh, you know, photonic systems are clearly very different in, in that, um, 
you know, measurements are different. The controls are very different. Um, there's, um, but at the same time, coherence is, you know, they're very, they're photons, you know, they're, they're not interacting with the environment in the way that a superconducting qubit is. Um, ions and, and spins, I think, also um, are kind of different in different places along that spectrum in terms of ions don't, um, you know, in, in vacuum, an ion is a very clean system. It doesn't interact very strongly with the environment, has very long coherence times, um, but these systems still have challenges with you know, you're still putting in controls and trying to control this very delicate system and the controls themselves can be noisy. Um, you know, you can have phase noise on, um, you know, your microwave or, or laser control. And then, um, you know, there's there's scaling issues for each of these. So, um, you know, the, the problems are kind of all the same, um, <laughs> even, though, um, even though the solutions may be different. Awesome. Okay, um, we don't have time for any more questions right now, although I can try to answer along with my colleagues some of the questions in the chat. Um, thank you again so much, Sarah, for your talk. I think that was a great job, and thank you for being here today. So I'm going to bring up Aram next, who's going to give us a sort of summary on the theory and software side of things. Aram, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Liv. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to be here. Great. I'm going to give you a little bit more of an introduction, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so very quickly, Aram Harrow is a professor at MIT whose research focuses on quantum information and computing. He works to understand the capabilities of quantum computers and quantum communication devices that we build in the future. And in the process, he creates connections to other areas of theoretical physics as well. He was a graduate student intern at IBM and helped develop the idea of coherent classical communication along with his work on the resource inequality method. He has greatly simplified our understanding of quantum information theory. 2008, uh, Harrow and others helped develop a quantum algorithm for solving linear systems of equations that provide a rare example of exponential quantum speed up. Um, he has been on the faculty of MIT since 2013. Previously, he was a lecturer at the University of Bristol and assistant professor at the University of Washington. His PhD was in 2005 from MIT in physics. He was the recipient in 2009 for the APS Outstanding Referee Award, 2015 the NSF Career Award, 2017 IEEE Information Theory Society Best Paper Award, and in 2018, uh, coincidentally, the Red Ralph Landauer and the Charles H. Bennett Award in Quantum Computing from APS, who we heard from just earlier today. All right, thank you again, Aram, for being here with us today, and we look forward to your talk. And again, I'll try and field as many questions as I can throughout. Great, looking forward to it. Thanks for the nice introduction. Okay, so let's see if this works. So it's my, yeah, it's my great pleasure to be here. It's too bad it couldn't be in person, but um, this is a, in this way, at least more people can attend, which is nice. So do you see a slide that says quantum information physics? Yep. Yes, um, it is. The, uh, the cover image is something that I, I learned from, I learned many things from Charlie Bennett. One of them is, is put a photo you've taken on the, on the cover. Um, when I tried to explain to my five-year-old what I do, I said, throw two rocks in the lake. And, uh, and uh, that's the best explanation I could come up with. Uh, but I'm still working on it. So the, uh, I want to try to give a little overview of uh, sort of an impossible task of, of what's what have been the theoretical bridges between quantum information and physics that have that have happened over the last 40 years, um, and even before, right? So for this conference even to come together in 1981, people had to decide that, um, as as I said this morning, it wasn't just uh, quantum information, but it was computing and physics had quite a lot to say to each other. That this there were many connections that they were not fully explored, and that there was a lot of digging that was worth doing there, and so. One of the first hints that there was something going on, at least on the quantum side, is that there are many hints that quantum mechanics said something was not just a theory of physics, but at some level was also a theory of information. I think the Heisenberg uncertainty principle was definitely a, an intellectually shocking development, said for the first time since Newton that we can have incompatible types of information. Right? So you can view it either as a practical limitation on your ability to build a me better microscope, um, or you could view it as, as really changing the definition of information. Information is something that you might have thought was a philosophical concept, something that you could, you could reason about without observing the world, just like space and time were before relativity came along. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says 
If the laws of quantum mechanics are true, then you can have incomparable, incomp incompatible uh, types of information, position momentum, for example, complementary observables. Uh, EPR, the EPR paper was another, another shocking development. And as you can see from the 30-year gap until Bell's theorem, uh, and then the additional gap until Bell's theorem was, was really built on, you know, people didn't know what to do with it for quite some time, right? It was just seen as, uh, well, quantum mechanics is a weird theory, but in the meantime, look at all these things we have to calculate. We can't even, you know, we're figuring out G minus two, we're finding new particles. Uh, there wasn't a lot of time to really dig into the meaning of what these, uh, these loose threads uh, corresponded to. One remarkable thing is that before classical information, before classical entropy, you know, that's something that the Greeks could have invented, uh, we had the von Neumann entropy. Uh, and before we had quantum channel capacities, we had subadditivity and strong subadditivity, you know, fairly sophisticated information inequalities that we still use every day in, in quantum information theory. Uh, but these were seen not yet as a um, as part of a, of a, a broader field of, of, inf of quantum information theory, of, of, you know, saying what can we do with quantum communication and computing resources. Um, a few people did see it that way. Stephen Wiesner famously was, uh, was ahead of his time with the insight that quantum mechanics could actually be useful for, um, you know, that, that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle was not just a limitation, but, it, but actually could be used, um, you could, you could, you could uh, get benefits from it. Um, and cryptography is a natural place to look, right? If, if something, something that is a limitation uh, in cryptography is a limitation to one party is, is a benefit to the other parties. Um, but it took a long time and an unusual way of looking at it to see it, and, and it was hard for him to convince other people to do it. Charlie Bennett played a, a key role in, in getting his, uh, developing Wiesner's ideas and uh, getting, encouraging Wiesner to, to publish. And of course, the theory of measurement is a very practical idea, which uh, was, was worked out in some detail in the 70s. But again, all these were, were fairly disjoint things, many of them solving problems in, in quantum physics, not really seen as a theory of, of information. And beyond quantum, there were many uh, signs of connections between physics and information before 1981. So one thing that's been, been talked about a fair amount today is um, Landau, sorry, the Maxwell's demon and uh, the, the many fruitful things that came out of it. So there was um, Shillard's connection to, uh, to entropy, Landauer's use of this to come up with the uh, Landauer's principle for the thermodynamic cost of erasure, and then Charlie Bennett's um, trying to say, well, do we really need to, you know, is this, is this cost of erasure actually an issue for computers? Or, uh, you know, can we have reversible computers, which, you know, were one of the steps towards, towards quantum computing as well as being uh, an important idea in their own right. Uh, and so this connection of, of thermodynamics to entropy to information theory is one that was, that was hinted at for a long time, but, but took some time to, uh, to really develop and, and be well understood. The other connection, so this is a picture of the, of the Fermiac uh, down here. This is a, a, uh, basically a Monte Carlo method of doing neutron scattering that, uh, that Fermi developed while ENIAC was being dismantled after World War II and moved to its new home, a process that took about two years. And he got impatient and built this little Monte Carlo trolley where you'd roll dice to tell how far it moved and, and simulate neutron scattering that way. Um, and this was an, an early example of this, and I guess more famously, the Metropolis algorithm, which really came out of Ulam and von Neumann uh, and, and to some extent Fermi and his collaborators. Uh, these were early examples of the connection between the, one of the earliest applications of computers, which was random sampling to solve physics problems. And it was understood early on that there was a deep connection between, uh, you know, between these topics, between, between algorithms, physics problems, randomness. Um, and uh, simulator annealing is an example, right, where we simulate a, a thermal process on a digital computer in order to solve a problem, which might be a combinatorial problem, might be a physics problem. Those connections at that level were, were, um, were well understood. But still, there was a. Uh, it was not. It was again not put into a into a, a larger a larger context. Um, and since 1981, things have really grown, basically driven by the promise of a quantum computer and of quantum information. Uh, people have started to realize that there are many many bridges between quantum information and physics, and so that's what I would try and tell you. Uh, 
tell you about today is about the, the many forms of synthesis that there have been between computing and physics um, since we started, the community started working on this at that, at that conference. Um, so one example, of course, is uh, when you build a quantum computer, there's a lot of noise, right? That's, uh, that's why we don't have big quantum computers right now. And so you might want to build a quantum error correcting code to stop that. Um, and one way of building a quantum error correcting code, in a sense, uh, something that's almost fully general, is to do it by encoding your qubit into the topological degrees of freedom of a, of a many-body system. So this is a picture of, of Kataev's, some check operators for Kataev's toric code that live on a, a torus like this. And these blue and red loops here correspond to how you have to act in order to, uh, to do a single qubit rotation. You, you have to act along an entire one of these loops. And so there's a deep connection between the topological order that we see in physics with things like the quantum Hall effect and how to store information in a redundant way in a physical system in a way where local changes don't mess up your quantum information. So this led, on the one hand, to trying to develop quantum memory, which is really a kind of a new phase of matter, something that would, just like a classical permanent magnet will remember it, it's, what direction it's pointing in, can you have a system that will remember a qubit uh, you know, just while sitting in a, in a thermal bath, uh, something that we know how to build theoretically in four dimensions. And in order to try to build this in three dimensions, Zheng Wan Ha came up with his famous code. Here are the, the check operators for the, the Ha code, which in turn have led to new developments in condensed matter theory called fractons, which are a, a new kind of, of quasi-particle. Uh, and a, a, a sort of system that seems to not be, at first seemed to not be described by a quantum field theory, but now people are, are finding ways of, of connecting it to field theories, and this led to, to an explosion of, uh, of, of interest in these new kinds of physical systems uh, that were dreamed up in, in an effort to build a quantum memory. At the same time, quantum error correcting codes are also how we understand the holographic principle, where the interior of some, of some region, unfortunately in a uh, negatively curved space, um, is, is isomorphic to the degrees of freedom on the boundary. This is uh, thought to be one of the more promising ways of understanding black holes. Um, and this, this idea that degrees of freedom in, in one region can be isomorphic to degrees of freedom in another region um, is very similar to what happens in a quantum error correcting code. And that's been a productive way of, of combining these two things. Um, and the, uh, so that's been one, one important set of, of connections that have that have really had both practical impact, so the practical study of quantum error, error correction continues, but also, and, and is, is, is super important, but also has had great and, and still growing impact on physics. Right? There was something that was just not on the radar of physicists of how can we store some information in, in non-local degrees of freedom, but driven in large part by, by quantum information, um, that's grown to become an important topic. Another set of beautiful connections, actually, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in, in more detail, are is the notion of locality in, a, in an interacting system. So uh, the DMRG, the density matrix renormalization group, is a way of trying to understand, trying to numerically study some uh, many body system. This gives rise to matrix product states, which are a way of, of modeling them. Um, they work if the system follows an area law, which means that the entanglement of a region grows only like the, um, like the, the surface area of that region. Um, and they connect to, to questions of locality. So is the system interacting? If its, if its interactions are local, then does the, um, do the, do the long-range degrees of, does, does the state inherit that locality, or does the state have long-range correlations that, that don't show up in the, in, the, in the raw interactions of the system? So these are questions that you would ask without needing an information, without needing a, a computational perspective. Uh, but the, the ideas of quantum information and of computer science have, have driven this also forward a lot. I'm going to tell you that in, in a little bit more detail after this. Uh, and I want to mention also briefly just three other beautiful examples of, um, of, of, of important connections between physics and, and computer science that have, uh, that have arisen since this conference. Um, so um, one of them that came out of... Um, Ike, uh, Ike Chong's group, so uh, Ted Yoder and Guang Hao Lo, together with, with Ike, have this beautiful series of papers where they first look at a, 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 a physics problem of composite pulses. I'm shining my, I'm hitting my ions with a laser, or I'm sh blasting my superconducting qubits with microwaves, and 
things are not quite calibrated, and every pulse I do is either 99% of the correct power or 101% of the correct power. But it's a systematic error. I keep making the same mistake. So can I have some composite pulse where my epsilon error will get driven down to order epsilon squared or order epsilon cubed? This is a very old question. And they found a new systematic way of doing it. And it turns out that their way of, of constructing systematically better composite pulses leads also to better algorithms for Hamiltonian simulation uh, and other quantum algorithms, and at the same time draws on uh, insights from, from polynomials and polynomial optimization that have been, uh, that have been used elsewhere in computer science. Um, so that's, that's one beautiful set of connections that goes back and forth between computing and, and physics. Another, another big one that's, that's quite recent, probably many of you have heard of, is this, um, this bombshell result, which goes by the title of MIP star equals RE, that starts from Bell's inequality and asks the question, so for a generalization of, of the Bell inequality, where you just have some set of questions that you ask to, to two, entang people, two players sharing entanglement, and then they return some answers, and every question-answer pair has a score. And they want to maximize their score. Uh, how hard is it for them to maximize their score? How hard is it computationally, rather, to find the strategy that maximizes their score? Um, and we know if they don't have entanglement, we know what the complexity is. And it turns out if they do have entanglement, the complexity is um, it's basically as hard as solving the halting problem. It's, uh, it's uncomputable. It's kind of a, a shocking answer computationally. And it also has implications for something called Khan's embedding question, which is basically trying to ask, can we, uh, do you ever really need infinite dimensions to represent field theory? A basic question in physics, you know, we can't really see all these very fine degrees of freedom. Uh, you know, can you just model everything by a finite dimensional system? And uh, surprisingly, that was actually resolved by this, uh, by this result that, that just started by looking at the complexity of Bell inequalities. One last one that, that I've worked on um, connects the monogamy of entanglement principle, which I, I learned about from uh, Turhall and, and DiVincenzo at, at IBM, and connects it to basically the idea that one system cannot be simultaneously entangled with many others at the same time. Entanglement between A and B trades off with entanglement between A and C. And uh, my collaborators and I connected this to many classical optimization problems, uh, such as the unique games conjecture, which is a essential question kind of at the boundary, uh, looking at optimization problems at the boundary of, of P and NP. OK, so I'm, I don't have that much time left. So let me just briefly talk about this one question in a little bit more detail, which is uh, which are about local Hamiltonians. So if you have a local Hamiltonian, which means you have some, some graph, maybe, and interactions along the edges, eigenvalues lambda 0 for the ground state, lambda 1 for the first excited state, and so on. Uh, to what it, we, so if the Hamiltonian is local in this way, you know, there's some kind of graph that defines the interactions, to what extent does the ground state inherit the locality? And correlations are known to respect this locality in the sense that if you look at the correlations between observable A in one region and B in another region, the correlations between them go down exponentially in the distance between these regions, according to some correlation length. That's uh, if the gap is a constant, the correlation length is also a constant. Um, and the the intuition for this, um, I probably don't really have time to explain it, but it's related to the the power method. Saying if you if you want to numerically on a computer, if you want to find the, the ground state, one thing you might do is it's kind of like trying to find the top eigenvalue of this related matrix of some multiple of the identity minus a Hamiltonian. And if you raise this to a large enough power, only the ground state survive. Everything else gets exponentially suppressed. And if the gap is big, you don't need to raise this to a very large power. And so a low degree polynomial of the Hamiltonian will approximate the ground state. But a low degree polynomial of the Hamiltonian means it's still pretty local. It doesn't spread correlations that far. And you have an approximation of the ground state that's still fairly local. That's sort of the, the rough intuition. The, the details are are a little bit hairy, but that's that's the high level intuition. Um, and I should probably skip this. Uh, there's, there are many questions related to the locality of ground states. There's sort of the gap and correlation decay. There's also something called the entanglement area law, um, an efficient matrix product state description, classical algorithms define this efficient description. And it turns out for 1D, if you have the gap, it implies all of these. In 2D, there's very recent development showing a, an area law under some, under some conditions. Uh, in, but still not known sort of in, in a lot of generality. And I want to just briefly point out the computer science principle that, that led to these insights. So I mentioned that you take this, um, 
identity minus Hamiltonian, raise it to some low power, and you approximate the ground state. And the higher the power, the better the approximation of the ground state, but also it makes more entanglement. And to do better than this sort of naive approximation, you need to have a lower degree polynomial, but keep your good approximation. And this is something that computer scientists have studied in detail. If you use a Chebyshev polynomial, then, uh, which is, means you take um, the Chebyshev polynomial of x, is you take the arc size of x, multiply by n, and then uh, take the cosine, you can see the green curve is if you just raise x to some power. And it starts off as 1, and then it drops off fairly rapidly, and it gets fairly flat. But the red curve is the same degree. It's a Chebyshev polynomial, and you see it drops off much, much faster. Uh, and this is an idea that's used productively in many classical algorithms for linear algebra, like solving linear systems of equations, um, and turns out to also be a, a good way of, of showing an area law, sort of a beautiful connection that uh, you heard from Umesh Vazirani this morning, and he was um, leading that work. OK, so let me wrap up. Um, what's going to happen next, right? What are the next 40 years going to be like? So the field of quantum computing seems to be going well. It's been fun to be a theorist, and it's really going to be cool to see when quantum algorithms becomes an empirical discipline, just like machine learning is and classical computers. We're going to learn a lot by just trying our algorithms, finding out things that are beyond our ability to prove. We're also going to change our, our understanding of quantum mechanics, um, You know, the way we, can, we think about it and teach it. Um, here's a textbook that, that teaches quantum mechanics from a quantum information point of view, and there's a lot of room there to, to enhance the way we think about it. And the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, 40 years ago, there were some hints that this was a good idea, but it was, it was not at all the consensus. This is kind of a fringe idea, slightly wacky. Uh, and there are a lot of things that, that are like that, right? So mRNA vaccines, some of the people working on them could not get funding. It just seemed like an idea that was not going to work. Um, pretty soon, we're going to take them for granted. So there's something today that seems like a wacky idea, unclear if it's worth it or whether it would ever work or whether it would ever pay off. Um, and some of those will never pay off. Uh, and there are probably some really important ideas that, uh, that we're, no one's thinking about right now, where very, very few people are thinking about. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to being surprised by something that we overlooked. And uh, hopefully, it'll, it'll, it'll be something that, um, yeah, that, that really comes out of left field. OK, so looking forward in the, to the rest of the talks today. Thanks for your attention. And uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll take a question. OK, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for uh, any live questions. Maybe we can try and answer a few more in the chat if, if we have time afterwards to do that. But Aram, thank you so much for, for your time and for that wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that the parallel sessions are going to begin now. Uh, you can find them to the links to your left. And also wanted to remind people that we will have a networking lounge at the end of both of the tracks today with some really cool discussions that will begin right around 530. So if you have time, feel free to stick around for those. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for uh, both of our presenters for their talks today. And thank you to the audience for, for tuning in.